thank you very much for that introduction and uh, for the opportunity to speak to so many people here tonight. It's, it's, uh, it's really kind of humbling. Um, I'm, uh, I'm having my own kind of panic attack just <laughs> contemplating this. So, Ronan, can you get my uh, gear to go? That's very good. Fantastic. The title on the AWARE notification was much more appropriate in many ways. It was about anxiety and about the um, ways in which we can experience anxiety disorder and about what we can do about them. But I suppose you'll forgive me if giving two lectures today, I've decided to combine the slides I prepared and effectively um, use them twice. So I, I earlier gave a talk at Trinity uh, on a, in a symposium they had on what they called happiness. And I thought, well, I can use the ideas from that and share them with you tonight. So that's part of the reason why that slide is up. But before I begin, I really want to say some words about aware and about how much we value aware here in St. Patrick's and how important it is to mental health and to the journey of recovery in Ireland. There is probably uh, no more significant area of recovery endeavour in Ireland than in the groups such as AWARE that meet in every town and every um, neighbourhood and community centres and in uh, hotels and uh, places all over the country, sharing the fellowship that you have of the journey of recovery and the experience uh, and the wisdom that is derived from that experience is valued in AWARE in a way that uh, humbles sometimes the deaf ears of the official services that I'm in. And so we have learned from AWARE and learned to respect what it has achieved and what it does. It also has something that's really stood the test of time and it comes from the experience of the people, the patients if you call them, service users, but I prefer to call us each other, who have authentic experience, the real voice of what's really happened in people's lives is shared in AWARE and heard in AWARE and I think is understood by AWARE as being the real nectar, the real essence that needs to sustain the journey of recovery. And so it's wonderful to be here with you to share a little bit of what um, I can contribute to that, that dialogue. I'm going to talk for maybe about 35, 40 minutes, so it seems a long time, and then perhaps we can have some questions. But I don't want this to be a didactic uh, lecture in the sense of uh, speaking of great knowledge from a, a height. Uh, these are ideas that I want to share with you about the nature of mental health suffering in general, about anxiety specifically, and about how we can recover by being mindful. And uh, I suppose I'll start by posing this question we now know that more than ever, in many ways, we're worrying ourselves sick. Uh, the experience of anxiety disorder is something that is a, a disabling uh, experience because it interferes with our ability to live and to work and to love, largely because it stops us engaging in life. Anxiety that is anxiety disorder is about avoidance as well as about experience of panic, obsession, um, rumination. It's also about that experience leading to avoidance of more positive experience of life. And that avoidance we call phobia. A phobia is a fear leading to avoidance. And in many respects, when I was training here and uh, working with people like uh, Pat McCone and others that you know very familiar with, I was taught to recognize the hidden uh, dilemma of avoidance as being a clue into how the function and the recovery of somebody is most hampered. And now we have lots of causes to worry. And every 15 minutes, we're given reminders on 24-hour news. I often wonder what the value of this is in our lives how it would affect us in Darwinian terms, anthropologically. How useful is it to be given 15-minute updates every day for 10 years of the fate of the banks? 
It certainly hasn't helped me any to know every 15 minutes that the news isn't good. And yet that's what we're told. The newsreaders lean into the television cameras and say, we'll keep you updated with this development or that development, but none of it is uplifting. The truth is that the stories of mental health are positive, and they can be really rewarding and uplifting. For me, one of the privileges of working in mental health is that I see and hear those positive stories every day. But you don't hear them on the news. You're not told that people recover. You're told there's a difficult situation and we'll keep you updated. More of the enlightened people in the media, I think, are catching on to this and realising that without wanting to be Pollyannish and somehow peddle some fruitless story, they're realising that we're switching off. One of my patients who happens to be from the lower Kilmacud Road, just for your information, surprised me one day when he told me that he'd overcome his anxiety and depression by deciding to emigrate from Ireland. I said to him, well, that's not really a very good idea in many ways, and, you know, uh, there's a lot of worries everywhere, and that's not really going to help. And besides, you know, where are you going to go? You know, have, do you speak a foreign language, or are you going to go to Canada or America? He said, no, no, I'm not going to any of those places. He said, I'm going to Stilorgan. <laughs> so I, I, I realized I'd got the wrong end of this consultation a little. I said, how do you mean you're going to Stilorgan if you're going to emigrate? He said, I'm mentally emigrating. I'm going to take charge of my mind. I'm going to decide what I hear, who I listen to, and what is actually going to uplift me. I realized that I had more to learn from this man than I could ever teach him. And in many ways, his journey is one which I think is mirrored in this particular slide. An understanding here that comes from a very learned, august scientific journal called Science, some years ago, tried to argue that we had got the economy and our situation of anxiety completely wrong. What we need to understand is that we're all together in an arc of life, from conception and birth through to middle age and ultimately to the end. And hopefully that will be as long a journey and as fruitful a journey as possible with many positive experiences. These blue lines here, early positive experiences of good diet and exercise, good parenting, the capacity to have social interaction that is generous and engaging, sport, education, and the ability to maintain resilience through physical activity, mental activity, interests, family that supports you, relationship. But look how many of these red arrows there are here with the pressures upon us. Early toxic experiences, trauma, neglect, abuse, illness, drugs, and stresses that come upon us all as we are in our middle years, perhaps captured between the caring of the younger and the challenge of caring of the older. These stresses of anxiety and depression come to not all of us, but to many of us in a way which makes it difficult to maintain this arc of living. The truth of it is, every family in the land has a mental health disorder. I can say this in this room because we all know it's true. But when I give talks elsewhere to doctors or to the public in general, I generally ask them to raise their hand and say if they have a mental health disorder in their family. And I usually find my hands up in the air for a very long time before they realise that it's safe to join in and raise their hand too. You see, we don't accept this value of the mental capital of life. And we then conceal the experience of mental health disorder because we think we ought to. And we fear that we won't gain that capital. We fear that we won't actually be valued. We fear that we won't recover. And so we keep it secret. But actually, our country will recover because it recovers its mental health. And when it recovers its mental health, it can sustain its recovery by valuing the mental capital of its people. They are interlinked. And when we have the leadership to understand that, 
and realize that we can recognize that there is a basis for contentment that's about mental health will be a long, a long road. You'll forgive me for being a doctor. It's something you have to cope with, but once they've made you into one, you're sort of stuck with it. And doctors make diagnoses. That's what they do. A bit like auctioneers, you know, they say the value of the house is location, location, location. For doctors, they make diagnoses, and then they make diagnoses, and then they make diagnoses. The trouble is, we have no blood test in mental health. There is no particular defined diagnosis. There is nobody with a diagnosis that actually really fits them. Ten people here could have the same diagnosis and ten entirely different mental health problems. Even if you look at the complexity of them, you'll notice that everybody is different because somebody can have a mild form or a complicated form and quite different from the complications that somebody else has. That's why it's so important to get a good assessment. Here is an illustration of this. All of the people in this blue area could be said to have depression, but some of them will have bipolar depression. Some of them might have depression and obsessive compulsive disorder, an anxiety disorder we'll talk about in a minute. Some of them might have depression and generalized anxiety disorder, an entirely different anxiety disorder. However, if you have one or two of these, the likelihood of having a third increases by about 7 out of 10. Equally, this person with depression and obsessive compulsive disorder is as different from this person with depression and specific phobia as night is today. And yet each could be said to have depression. We have a problem with this D word. We all think we know what it says, but we actually have different meanings for it, and everybody in experiencing it is experiencing something that has individual aspects to it. Of course, you know the common features, the persistent low mood, the pervasive despair, the early morning wakening, the sense of shift as the day comes along, only to be crushed by the dread of the next night, the loss of weight, the loss of appetite, the loss of energy. These features of depression that you know can be allied to these features of anxiety that we're going to talk about tonight, where fear leads to avoidance, and that avoidance leads to further fear and further depression. It's not a happy story the way I tell it, but I tell it for authenticity. There is no point in dressing up the problem and pretending it isn't great. But each of us has a childhood. This, I like to describe, is a picture of mine. <laughs> you may laugh, but it's true. In my mind, I was the Milky Bar Kid. I remember when this ad came out, we bought, well, I didn't, my grandmother bought our first television ca uh, screen, television, TV, telly. I remember it very well because we bought it to watch the World Cup. My granny loved football. And uh, we watched that, and it was the first time that I saw TV ads. It was a year, I think, before RTE came. So there was no sex in Ireland at that stage. <laughs> and I remember seeing this chap. Who of us, which of us can sing the song? I may, I, I may just break out into song here. But the Milky Bar Kid was strong and tough, and only the best was good enough. Only you couldn't get white chocolate in Ireland in those days. Long before there was um, uh, a ban on sex, there was a ban on white chocolate, <laughs> which was much more important to this five-year-old boy, except that I had an aunt who was a nun in the Falls Road, my granny's sister. And she used to come down to Sandy Mount with bags of contraband, smuggled sweets you couldn't get in the south, including Milky Barkers. Yeah. Long before they smuggled other things in the Belfast train, I was smuggling white chocolate. <laughs> it's not all of my childhood, but it's a part of it, a happy memory of it. Brings back live to creatures and people that I loved. But there's more there, and it all stays with you. Childhood memories are important, 
They're the ones that last longest. And of course, there's family. Each of us has a family. I raise my hand when I talk to mine. But each of us has a family. I ask my kids to name me the archetypal family, the family that really mattered. And without any hesitation, they told me it was the Simpsons. <laughs> if you ask yourself, it's a very strange question, really, but it's a strange answer. And they said to me, actually, Homer is the archetypal dad. How can Homer be the paragon of being a dad? They were absolutely clear. They, I said, tell us what's good about Homer Simpson. What's good about Homer Simpson is that you can depend on him, they said. You can depend on him to let you down. <laughs> and each of us has a lifestyle as well as a family and a childhood. This being an image of mine. I'm not known for being an exercise freak. I hunt the channels with my channel changers and sit in the evenings. I know I should be doing more. But there you go. What do you do in your lifestyle? What can we do? Do you play? Do you sing? Do you dance? Do you... Do you run? Do you, do you visit anybody? Do you care for somebody? What gives you joy? What brings a smile to your face? What might actually be a lifestyle? You know, if you decided to go out and get one, where would you go? What would it look like? And how much of this is in your heart? Too much, I can tell you. Loads too much. You see, depression is a bit like, well, imagine your life is a bit like a motor car. And you've got this trailer in the back. And in it, there's all this stuff. Shame and guilt, regrets about the past. You're pulling it behind you. Dragging it along. It's a weight. Only in this particular vehicle that we're talking about today, we're also pushing a snowplow in front. It's the fear of anxiety in the front of us. We're dragging this thing from the past, and we're pushing against this thing we fear in the future. For depression and anxiety, it's a real combination which bedevils the person because they can no longer live in the present, nor reconcile the past, nor face the, the future. It's in a time warp. And shame and regret, guilt, do nothing. But this particular piece of graffiti recommends that we should go out and do something to be proud of. Wouldn't that be great? It would be if we believed there was something and some place to do it in. But of course, life's changed. I suppose Mrs. T is no longer in power. She's no longer with us. But are her sentiments still there? We've lived through a few decades where we decided that maybe neighborhoods and family, maybe communities didn't matter. There is no such thing, she said, as society. There are only individual men and women, and there are families. They've cut out the last line. The next thing she said was, and there is shopping. <laughs> so in other words, if you weren't a consumer, you didn't count. This was the end of society, and of course it is completely contrary to a recovery idea, where actually recovery is in home, but also in neighbourhood, and in places where we're entitled to expect, as a just, as a right, to be able to live in community with people we share a space with and with whom we value time, not just shopping. And then, of course, there's work. And there's a balance to it. Any of us who are working have to ask ourselves, do we bring baby in the bag with us? It's not a good place to grow up, you know. And yet, there has to be a balance of things. One of my colleagues says to me, why is it, Jim, that you have all the balance and I have all the work? <laughs> and how much pressure do we feel we're putting on our, our kids now? You know, they talk about Lake Wobegon, you know, where all the children are above average. You know, actually, we each have capacities, but the pressure we put on each other. I dread the leaving cert time. Not because I have to do it again, although in my dreams I am in that place. How many of us wake up with dreams about doing Leaving Cert Irish? I certainly do. No, because every Leaving Cert time we have a wave of families and young people worried about whether they're going to get this exam and make the difference as though it mattered. I remember saying to 
one of my teachers, when I didn't do so well at an exam, I said, I haven't done so well. He said, no, you haven't done well. I said, will it matter? He said, yes, it'll matter. I was feeling a little bit undercared for at this point. I said, it's going to matter. Yes, it will matter. He said, but over time you'll find it won't matter terribly. <laughs> and then there's sleep. How much of us is restored by sleep? Well, a great deal. In fact, sleep is essential for restoration and for recovery. And we now know that that boy in the Milky Bar ad was getting about nine hours sleep at night. And the same boy now would be getting less than six. We have a busy day. There's all that 15-minute news to catch up with, all those updates about disasters that we need to know about. And so we don't get to sleep. We have the iPads and the news and the interference, but also a sense that actually we should be continuing all the time. But this is a mistake. Actually, rest is restorative, and sleep is a hugely powerful tool for well-being. We know it's not a waste of time. It's actually a restorative time. And we now know a great deal about the biology of it. And if you're interested, I'd recommend you to go on your computer and look at the TED Talk by this man, Russell Foster. Apart from being hugely entertaining, it's very informative about the value of restorative sleep. Russell Foster. And then there's burnout. How many of you feel burned out? Again, my sceptical colleague says people aren't burned out. They were just never on fire in the first place. The reality is we do burn out. We get to the point where we've done so much and we feel maybe underappreciated, underrecognized, or undersustained, and we can't carry on. And so we lose touch with the very values that started us in any work we do. We feel that the support needs to be greater and that the workload and the stress is too much and we tip over. But actually, this slide, which comes from a study of caring for doctors who are burned out, tells us a useful story that's worthwhile. It's this story. It's a story about the various variables that help us address our mental well-being. Some of them are our background awarenesses some of them are what they call mediating variables, things that we could change or address. They're somewhere between who we are and what we might become. And then there's outcomes, this one being a poor one, but experience of stress can be balanced. Let's look at the origin ones. Man or woman, does it matter? It does. The truth is that the closest thing to a man is a woman. That's a, an observation that I've made many years ago. I don't think you probably realize how profound that is. But the fact is that we are one human species. But we are different. And the stresses and strains, the challenge of having it all or doing it all, or as in men's case, having it all and doing nothing, um, makes life difficult for men and women. Our age matters. Whether we have children or don't have children, how many we have. For these doctors, whether they worked alone or in academic practices such as this one, or how many hours they worked, these were factors that mattered for their well-being. Similarly, there was where they, where they had control over their work, whether there was much interference or support from home, and whether there was a balance between stress and satisfaction. All of these could be looked at and modified with change so that the outcome wasn't necessarily burnout. The outcome could be modified depending on the changes and the stresses, but also the choices and the satisfactions that people could make. And there are the existential questions. How many people here have decided to go through with it and go bald? I don't meet many people who put up their hands and say, no, I'm wearing a wig. They don't do that. On the other hand, we have choices to make about life. This from the famous slide in Dame Street, which was rescued some years ago by Bono, is one I love because it seems to ask the kind of question which appears to be imponderable, but actually is, in essence, a life question. Why do it at all? To be or not to be? Are we going to get better? Are we going to face this? Ultimately, we are alone with these decisions, certainly in 
humanistic terms, we see each other and we recognize we have to get up for ourselves. But there is a gap in that analysis. That gap could be a spiritual gap. It could be a gap of faith. It could be a gap of belief. It could be a gap of experience. It could be a gap of love. It could be a gap of abuse. It could be a gap of trauma. But the gap that's there has to be addressed. And regardless of whether we're in the emergency room or not, belief in ourselves, at very least, has to be addressed. The truth of it is, change is inevitable. And in mental health recovery, change is something that we have to see as opportune. We can change this pattern of driving our vehicle, carrying the burden of shame and guilt and regret of the past with us. We can let it go. And we can decide not to shove against this snowstorm of future fear. We can drive another way. All of this takes a challenge. And this slide is one I like because it allows me to use my pointer for a long time. <laughs> if you imagine that life could be categorized on a graph in which everything we knew was agreed upon on this one, consensus. All right? We have high consensus up here. Everything is agreed upon. And low consensus here, nothing is agreed upon. Now, up here, we might be lemmings. We all, all the lemmings agreed that jumping over the cliff is a good idea. So, but nonetheless, there's high consensus. Let's look here. Here are the facts, the truths. At this point, there's low certainty. But at this point, there's really high certainty. If you combine these two, up here, we have a world which is standardized. Everything's perfect. Everything's ordered. I imagine it's like living in Norway. No Norwegians in the audience, no? Sometimes I used to say Canadians and people got offended. They used to, the Canadians pop up, but Norwegians don't tend to. Here, it's a bit like my life. Low certainty, low consensus, a feeling of deep chaos. What do you do at this point? Well, actually, this is an illusion. The truth is we're in this place, a middle place, and we find it uncomfortable, but we need to embrace it. It's a place of variable consensus with increasing complexity of differing views and understandings. And little certainty, certainly nothing like the high certainties we imagined in the past, but not yet the kind of chaotic loss of any truths that we fear of the future. No, it's a place of complex judgment, a place where we can go and experience the tension of knowing that we don't know what to do. That tension is a good place to be in. If we embrace it and do so with courage and look for leadership from each other, leadership from aware, for example, a wonderful statement about its belief in recovery is made by aware's meetings every day and they know that the judgments they need to recommend and you need are not straightforward. This willingness to embrace the challenge of time and the complexity of time is something we haven't always had in the past. But it's a good place to go, not a place to fear. Because the world is a beautiful place. But we must see it for what it is. And we must be in it for what we can be. Not stuck in a spacesuit, looking back at it, wondering what we're going to do. On the other hand, when Neil Armstrong made that extraordinary landing and looked back, he saw something that was real, something that was true. The universe, the stars, and the world, the world, world as a round place. He didn't see this. A combination of fear, anxiety, and depression, stigmatized and hidden, fearful. But that's what we see. That's why I ask each of you to feel proud when you raise your hand. You too can say, I am Spartacus. I share this human reality, this existence of my life, 
includes the experience of being a patient or loving or knowing somebody who is a patient or expecting at some stage that I will be a patient. This is part of what it is to be alive. And it is something that is noble and part of our human experience that we shouldn't feel shameful or regret. And it is as far from the image that you'll see in the media as can possibly be. This languorous pose of Kate Moss is as far from obsessive compulsive disorder as you can get. Whatever Kate is thinking about, and I don't wish to be rude, she is not obsessing. She is not experiencing what we know is the terrible scourge of obsession, which is an intrusive, unwanted idea, thought, or image which returns again and again into the brain and which is extremely difficult to put out and which is actually a brain and psychological disorder. No, Kate is not experiencing that. And one would have to say that obsession perfume is nothing to do with obsession. But given that I'm a sort of fastidious sort of dude myself, I often tell people that I wrote to Calvin Klein, the makers of Obsession Perfume, and asked them what was in it. (laughs) And you might be surprised to know that they wrote back to me. And they said, Dear Mr. Lucy, we want you to know that Obsession Perfume has within it a delicate mixture of fragrances of oak moss and vanilla and it is suitable for day wear. (laughs) So in response to their generosity, I thought I'd always tell you that. You know, what did you learn at the Aware Lecture? Well, you know, there you go. And what's this? Here's another false image of mental health and of womanhood and of humanity. Addict. I cannot understand whether this creature is two people or one person. (laughs) I feel I shouldn't really look at it too long, actually. (laughs) And similarly, the remedies that our society gives us are not truthful. One of the things about aware and about the experience of listening to the voice of people who've had mental suffering is that you get truth when you listen. But you don't get authenticity too often. This is not a recession buster. Even on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, when it's three bucks a day, it's not a recession buster. There is no future in terms of busting the recession, in intoxication or addiction. Recovery has to be where we're going. It's what we're about. We're about men's health and women's health, and we're about building a culture of mental health. And that culture will eat strategies for breakfast every day. What does that mean? It means that we can actually do the things that matter. We can build a society, a neighborhood, a fraternity, a club, a community that actually respects each other for our experience and values the possibility of recovery and believes in doing the things that makes that recovery happen. That's what culture is. Culture is the stuff that goes on when nobody's looking. Strategy is the stuff that's in the books. We know that culture is what makes difference. And we can join with each other, unify around a culture of mental health, and build recovery very genuinely. But we'd have to do it by abandoning many of our old fractious disputes. We'd have to build resilience. Resilience is the operating system for the 21st century. And what do I mean by resilience? I mean a capacity to have a security of purpose, a value in education, positive values, friendships, a belief in our own talent and the value of our interests, some willingness to have social competency. Many of my patients have social anxiety. They blush, they turn their head and become shy. They feel fearful just in any social circumstance. And I ask them to go to the party and to blush. I ask them to go and feel the heart palpitating. I ask you that if you fear society, be in society. Because actually we need to embrace those who are anxious and fearful. We need to be confident that we can be friends to each other in a way which is positive 
and which is not just secure, but is positive and talented and full of interest. These domains of resilience are things that we can build. We can look to each other and build a culture of those. But we have to come back to Homer at some stage. Homer here is a, an emblem for the brain. And forgive me for loving the brain. I like his values, at least some of them. I like the way he emphasizes the importance of sleep. You've heard me emphasize that. I like the way he has a certain moral consciousness up there somewhere. There are certain do's and certain don'ts. He has some other values, uh, sweet, sweet beer and sex are obviously very prominent in his mind. But I also like the way he's open-minded, or in Homer's terms, it's post your ad here. <laughs> the fact is that the brain tells us a great deal of story. There are people in here who actually knew the people who made this slide. And so I'm going to describe it with a consciousness of that. <laughs> But I want you to know that, in my view, this piece of research is the most important piece of mental health progress that's been made in the last 50 years. Have I bigged it up, as they say, enough? I'm going to tell you about the most important piece of mental health research in the last 50 years. Did I tell you how important this slide is? <laughs> Have I got your complete attention? I'm now overwhelmed. I'm so excited about it, I just can't go. And I'll have to try and focus on it. This is a brain. Imagine that the brain is your boiled egg in the morning, and you chop it across the top. And now you look down. Here would be the yolk, and the outside would be the white. Only this particular egg is a brain of a human being, and the yolk is the blue, which is actually fluid, and the white is the cortex the thinking part of the brain. These would be, the eyes would be here, this, the nose would be here. So these are the orbital frontal lobes, the middle frontal lobe. This is all the good stuff behind your forehead. You know that our frontal lobes really do generate and experience a whole load of executive function and capacity that other creatures don't have. But genetically, it's largely a response to environment, and our extraordinary response to environment that has formed these frontal lobes. And in the frontal lobes, thoughts, experiences that are generated are channeled down to the deeper parts of the brain. You see here, these, pieces, these are called the striatum, and they're filters. And if they're working properly, they should filter out all that nonsense and say, no, no, you don't need to worry about that. No, forget that. But in this man, who is sitting in front of his greatest fear, those filters are not working. He's sitting in front of a plate of dog feces. Now, I've often you know, been told not to use the vernacular in relation to this, but I think we have to actually do this just to get the feeling. He's sitting in front of a plate of shite, first. You know, that's, that's, we've, got to, we've, got to really, really, we've got to feel his pain, okay? And this is an awful position to be in, because it is his most fearful experience. And what happens to his brain in front of the same plate is that these frontal lobes become overactive and they generate a cycle of activity which goes through these two filters and reverberates around and around. And this is a visual image of him thinking the obsession. This is 20 years or more old and since this slide it's been possible to image somebody thinking or praying, telling a joke, thinking a happy thought. You can actually see the distinct patterns of each of these things. But here we're seeing the pattern of activity of a man obsessing. On the right-hand side, same man in front of the same dreaded plate, but 10 weeks later after therapy. It matters little in one way what the therapy is. He's now recovered, and how do we know? Look what's happened to his frontal lobes. Here, the deep orange, heavy activity with lots of glucose being used. And here, subtler, calmer area. Look here, the deep striatal areas, compared to the right, calmed once again. The degree to which this calming has happened correlates, that's to say, parallels the degree of his recovery. He's better, and his brain has changed. 
Is he better because his brain has changed? Or does becoming better make his brain change? These are philosophical debates, but the reality is they correlate with each other. And in the context of therapy, therapy has brought about a brain change. Because you cannot change this without changing the way your genes and your proteins are made. Acutely, you're actually instructing your brain to do something that we do throughout much of our lives and never know. We grow, folks. He's actually grown here. And we've imaging here the growing of a healthy communication, a healthier brain. You see, when you learned your seven times tables, or your nursery rhymes, or your prayers, or the things that you'll take with you to the end of your life, they were laid down in your brain through learning. And learning is growth. But we cannot stop learning. In recovery, we learn again and again and again. And this learning correlates with our recovery. Here, in this pa patient, he learned through therapy. This behavior therapy was actually a crude form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, why is this the most important piece of doodah that you've ever heard? Well, one of the reasons is that it offends everybody. Over here, we have an image of a man with an obsessive compulsive disorder, dismissed by many people as a worry. It's an anxiety disorder, but dismissed by even people who believe in anxiety disorders. And yet, those people would be, and were, deeply shocked to see that you could image it in the brain. You could see a worry. The people who were mindful didn't want to see their position in the brain, exposed physically and understood. But look at this slide. Here's a slide of somebody recovered because of a mindful therapy. And the people in this camp were deeply offended that you could demonstrate in the brain the effect of a psychotherapy. The two schools of mental health, known in abusive terms as the mindless and the brainless, were therefore both offended by this piece of work. And again and again this has been replicated. I was part of the 11th study that replicated this in London many years later. But the fact is, it's been shown in Paris, in San Paolo, in Munich, in all kinds of places all over the world, that therapy actually changes your brain is now accepted. Except that the people who want to adapt an antagonistic picture ignore this data. They continue to, to propose a purely biological view or a purely psychological view. And they compete with each other with all the intolerance and vigor of zealots. And unfortunately, we are at the mercy of that kind of noise when we try to give the positive message of recovery. Because the truth is, we now work together. Nobody who is informed of the data will oppose the reality of psychological therapy or the benefit of it. Neither will anybody oppose the importance of the brain as being a uh, plastic area in which that therapy takes effect. We have now a mindful revolution. And there is a moment now where we can bring together the factions of uh, mental health and together place people who've experienced the conditions in the heart of the journey. Now, I don't want to go through all of this stuff. It's too much. But mindfulness basically starts with the body. And it's about a meditative technique and it doesn't come burdened with any particular set of beliefs. It actually can be used by those with beliefs or those without. But what it does, we now know, is it harnesses brain mechanisms. And we actually now know how it, it alters many of the connectivities of the brain. And it is an exercise which is both beneficial and mindful. And we now know that as a cornerstone for the treatment of people with recurrent and brittle depressive disorder, many people with, with whom aware is, is, is deeply aware, that the NICE guidelines, that's to say the authoritative guidelines for the treatment of conditions in UK, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, it recommends mindfulness as the cornerstone of continuing treatment for people with brittle depressive disorder. Because 
Not one, not two, but five randomized controlled trials have shown that it is a benefit. Unfortunately, our practice is still behind the data. And this is because of our adherence to the old factions rather than the facts. But patients are flocking in droves, looking for and finding ways to access this kind of therapy. And the great thing about the emancipation of the social media is that those um, access points are now available to people with a laptop or a mobile phone. And now we know that online availability actually does bring about a similar benefit. We also know that it's not just those with depression benefit, but other quite um, challenging anxiety disorders or traumatic disorders can benefit from a a component of mindfulness. Here, a study looking at the benefits in post-traumatic stress disorder. And we know that people who find sleep difficult chronic insomnia being a real problem for people with with many mood disorders, can also benefit. Here, a study looking at the benefit in insomnia. And here, we know that regardless of any particular diagnostic group, collective groups who experience stress and trauma in their lives, this group being teachers, can actually benefit from introducing a mindfulness program as part of their work-life balance. We've taken this to heart now, and now we run mindfulness groups at 8 in the morning and 7 in the evening sometimes for our staff. You might wonder at that, but we need to care for the carers as well, and mindfulness has turned out to be a very popular means of doing this. But there's more that we can do, and I want to encourage you that engaging with life is worthwhile. I want you to consider singing. You can see that's not really taking off here. <laughs> I think you're afraid that I might start the song. That, that's, that's, there's no fear of that. I, 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 I want you to look at this set of studies. This is from a very good paper that l- collects both um, single cases but also I think four uh, randomized studies of the benefit of joining a choir. And it turns out that joining a choir is really good for you. I started this particular job, a privilege I took up in 2008, and uh, I was aware that it was a stressful gig. Um, And I was wondering, how was I going to manage this? And it took me a while before I discovered a choir, and it's been a real big help, I can tell you. They've been fantastic. The studies show that being in a choir really helps your mood, helps you manage anxiety, helps your self-esteem, helps your well-being. Apparently, it's not as good if you're actually a really good singer. (laughs) But if you're not a very good singer, it's really super. So I'm doing fine in my choir. (laughs) Music, really helpful. We've expanded our twilight program, our program for what happens before the day begins and the evenings and the weekends. And we have a chamber choir that comes in here, a chamber group that comes here on the weekends. But it's been done elsewhere. And this is a lovely study from uh, Tala Hospital where they actually decided to measure the benefits of introducing a chamber orchestra into the hospital environment. And it turns out you can measure the benefit and the well-being of the people because of that intervention. They called it a cure for the soul, which is interesting, harking at the spiritual gap that there is there, the benefit of live music in the general hospital. But we know also that this kind of uh, attention to the peaceful mind can apply to almost any group. Perhaps one of the most beneficial areas that's been used is in the care of the elderly. The elderly might find the next recommendation a little bit harder, but I would recommend that we consider this one. I want you to consider dancing. Now, you might say, well, this has really gone too far. (laughs) But anybody who's watched that dance sequence in uh, West Side Story um, has to realise this is fantastic stuff. And it turns out there are studies showing it works. Here's a study for the value of a dance video. You know, you you, you you do an interactive video on on the screen, and you actually... Turns out that makes you feel better, if you can get up and do it. But there's even here, I came across this rather obscure but amusing story. The role of Tai Chi, cultural dancing, and playing a musical instrument in uh, feeling happier if you're a Chinaman, which is fantastic. (laughs) Turns out it works for Irish people as well. 
Really, I want you to keep calm and breathe. What we want is to recognize and acknowledge the real deep trauma of depression and anxiety and not to feel fr frightened from raising your arm. On the other hand, we need to start giving the positive message of the reality of the recovery that's possible and the potential means for that recovery. And we need to do that for ourselves, for our families and for our country, which has gone through a recession depression that it hasn't seen in many a long decade. It's got to stop, folks, and it will stop if we can actually address our mental health need. We can build things like gratitude and hope and mindfulness and we can do that by actually building on the strengths of our experience and the authenticity of our experience. And we can do that, and we actually even can measure it. It's turned out that we can find the ways in which psychological and mental health well-being can actually be enhanced by engaging in these human things. You see, there is a society, there is a family, there is a community, and there is a deeply valued well of worth in each of us which is something we can tap into. We can let the well of shame and guilt drain away and replenish these vessels with positivity if we just choose to, and if we do so knowing that it's with each other, with singing, with dancing, with believing in ourselves, that that becomes possible. Happiness is a hard thing to define, but we do know that the contented are engaged with each other are at peace about their lives and can look forward to the future with a sanguine contentment that is enhanced by engaging with life. It wouldn't be fair if I didn't tell you a little bit about my book. But on the other hand, I'm not going to. I'm going to ask you not to wait to be happy again. I'm very glad that you came and heard me today and you've been so kind to listen. Thank you very much.